boys and girls. We're going to be reading um, the story of Sinbad the Sailor. Um, so I am going to be presenting my screen because the document is actually on the computer and you can follow along with me this time around. This is one of the Arabian Nights stories um, and it is a story that's in um, the Aladdin book if your parents purchased that for you. But sorry, just a moment, I'm finding in the window. Um, but the version that's in your book is a little bit shorter and less detail, and um, I think that this is a more enjoyable version. So we're going to read it together. Now Sinbad the Sailor is the name of this story. In the reign of the same caliph, Harun al-Rashid, of whom we have already heard, there lived at Baghdad a poor porter called Hindbad, which means a traitor. One day, when the weather was excessively hot, he was employed to carry a heavy burden from one end of the town to the other, as you can see in the picture. Being much tired, he took off his load and sat upon it near a large mansion. He was much pleased that he stopped at this place for the agreeable smell of wood, of aloes, and of pastilles that came from the house, mixing with the scent of the rose water, completely perfumed and embalmed the air. Besides, he heard from within a concert of instrumental music, accompanied with the harmonious notes of nightingales and other birds. This charming melody and the smell of several sorts of savory dishes made the porter conclude that there was a feast with great rejoicings within. His business seldom leading him that way, he knew not to whom the mansion belonged, but he went to some of the servants whom he saw standing at the gate in magnificent apparel or clothes and asked the name of the propri proprietor. So whose mansion is this? What's the feast all about, he wonders. How, replied one of them, do you live in Baghdad and not know that this is the house of Sindbad the sailor, that famous voyager, who has sailed round the world? The porter lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, loud enough to be heard, Almighty creator of all things, consider the difference between Sinbad and me. I am every day exposed to fatigues and calamities and can scarcely get coarse barley bread for myself and my family, while happy Sinbad profusely expends immense riches and leads a life of continual pleasure. What has he done to obtain from thee a lot so agreeable? And what have I done to deserve one so wretched? So he thinks, why does God shower all of these blessings, all of this fortune on Sinbad? What did Hindbad do? Now, while the porter, Hindbad, was thus indulging his melancholy, melancholy means sadness, a servant came out of the house and taking him by the arm, bade him follow him. For Sinbad, his master, wanted to speak to him. Once again, and it gets a little confusing, but Hindbad is this person who is trading things, coming to the mansion. Sinbad is the sailor who has the mansion. Now the servant brought him into a great hall where a number of people sat round a table covered with all sorts of savory dishes. At the upper end sat a comely, venerable gentleman with a long white beard, and behind him stood a number of officers and domestics, all ready to attend his pleasure. So these are people that work for him, including probably slaves or servants at the time. This person was Sindbad. Hindbad, whose fear was increased at the sight of so many people, and of the banquet so sumptuous, so rich and decadent, saluted the company, trembling. Sindbad makes him draw near, and seating him at his right hand, served him himself and gave him excellent wine, of which there is a, an abundance upon the sideboard. Now Sinbad had himself heard the porter complain through the window, and this it was that indulged him to have him brought in. When the repast was over, Sinbad addressed his conversation to Hindbad and inquired his name and employment, and said, I wish to hear from your own mouth what it was you lately said in the street. Now at this request, Hindbad hung down his head in confusion and replied, My lord, I confess that my fatigue put me out of humor 
and occasionally to utter some indiscreet words, I, which I beg, beg you to pardon. So Sinbad, you know, was crying out to God to saying, why? This Sin, Sinbad have so many more riches than me. And now he's feeling guilty because Sinbad thinks it's complaining. Do not think I am so unjust, resumed Sinbad, as to resent such a complaint. But I must rectify your error concerning myself. You think, no doubt, that I have acquired without labor and trouble the ease and indulgence which I now enjoy. He's saying, you think that I have just had this wonderful life without any trouble at all. But do not mistake, he says. I did not attain to this happy condition without enduring for several years more trouble of body and mind than can well be imagined. Yes, gentlemen, he added, speaking to the whole company, now the whole, everybody in the room. I assure you that my sufferings have been of a nature so extraordinary as would deprive the greatest miser of his love of riches. Meaning anybody would think that it is way too much suffering. And as an opportunity now offers, I will, with your leave, relate all of those dangers I have encountered, which I think will not be uninteresting to you. Okay, now the first voyage of Sinbad the Sailor, we're gonna hear about seven of these. He says, my father, this is Sinbad telling the story now, was a wealthy merchant of much repute. A lot of people loved him and knew him. He bequeathed me a large estate, meaning gave me a lot of money, which I wasted in riotous living. I quickly perceived my error in that I was misspending my time, which is of all things the very most valuable, which is true. We've got not that much time every single day. We better make the most of it. I remembered the saying of the great Solomon, which I had frequently heard from my father. A good name is better than precious ointment. And again, another Solomon quote, wisdom is good with an inheritance. Struck with these reflections, I resolved to walk in my father's ways, and I entered into a contract and embarked with them on board a ship we had jointly fitted out. So he's deciding, I better be wise with my time and do something of myself, have a good career, maybe have other people who know who I am and think highly of me. Now we set sail and steered our course toward the Indies through the Persian Gulf, which is formed by the coasts of Arabia Felix on the right and by those of Persia on the left. At first I was troubled with seasickness, but speedily recovered my health and was not afterwards subject to that complaint. In our voyage, we touched at several islands where we sold or exchanged our goods. One day while under sail, we were becalmed near a small island but little elevated above the level of the water and resembling a green meadow. The captain ordered his sails to be furled and permitted such persons as were so inclined to land of this number I was one. So several islands there landing on one that looks like a green meadow. But while we were enjoying ourselves and eating and drinking and recovering ourselves from the fatigue of the sea, the island on a sudden trembled and shook us terribly. Sounds like an earthquake. Now the trembling of the island was perceived on board the ship and we were called upon to re-embark speedily and get back on the ship. Or we all should be lost for what we took for an island proved to be actually the back of a sea monster. They got on top of the back of the sea monster on accident. They thought it was an island. The nimblest got into the sloop, meaning the ones who uh, were quick and athletic. Others betook themselves to just swimming. But as for myself, I was still upon the island when it disappeared into the sea. And I had only time to catch hold of a piece of wood that we had brought out of the ship to make a fire. So he's just holding onto a little piece of wood. Meanwhile, the captain, having received those on board who were in the sloop, and taken up some of those that swam, resolved to improve the favorable gale that had just risen, and hoisting his sails pursued his voyage so that it was impossible for me to recover the ship. Thus was I exposed to the mercy of the waves. He's in the middle of the ocean, just on a little piece of wood. 
all the rest of that day and the following night. By this time, I found my strength was gone and despaired of saving my life, when happily, a wave threw me against an island. The bank was high and rugged, so that I could scarcely have got up had it not been for some roots of trees which I found within reach. When the sun arose, though I was very feeble or weak, both from hard labor and want of food, it's been a long I crept along to find some herbs fit to eat and had the good luck not only to produce some, but likewise to discover a spring of excellent water, which contributed much to recover me. After this, I advanced farther into the island and at last received a fine plain where I perceived some horses feeding. I went toward them when I heard the voice of a man who immediately appeared and asked me who I was. I related to him what my adventure had been, after which, taking me by the hand, he led me into a cave where there were several other people, no less amazed to see me than I was to see them. I partook of some provisions which they offered me, some food and drink. I then asked them what they did in such a desert place, to which they answered that they were grooms belonging to the Maharaja, sovereign of the island. He's the king of that island and that every year they brought thither the king's horses for pasturage. So they're grooms, meaning they um, take care of these horses. They added that they were to return home on the morrow, tomorrow. And had I been one day later, I must have perished, which means died, because the inhabited part of the island was a great distance off. And it would have been impossible for me to have got thither without a guide. It's a good thing he got there right in time when people happened to be on the right side of the island to find him. Now, next morning, they returned to the capital of the island, took me with them, and presented me to the Maharaja. He asked me who I was and by what adventure I had come into his dominions. After I had satisfied him, meaning he told his story and the um, Maharaja or king, he accepted it. He told me he was very much concerned for my misfortune and at the same time ordered that I should want for nothing, which commands his officers were so generous and careful as to see exactly filled. So he's going to be gifted a lot of things. Now, being a merchant, I frequented men of my own profession and particularly inquired um, for those who were strangers that perchance I might hear news from Baghdad or find an opportunity to return. For the Maharaja's capital is situated on the sea coast and has a fine harbor where ships arrive daily from the different quarters of the world. I frequented also the society of the learned Indians and took delight to hear them converse. But with all, I took care to make my court regularly to the Maharaja and conversed with the governors and petty kings, his tributaries that were about him. They put a thousand questions respecting my country, and I, being willing to inform myself as to their laws and customs, asked them concerning everything which I thought worth knowing. Asking lots of questions. Now, there belongs to this king an island named Castle. They assured me that every night a noise of drums was heard there, whence the mariners fancied that it was the residence of um, Gegyal. I determined to visit this wonderful place, and in my way thither saw fishes of a hundred and two hundred cubits long, huge fish, that occasion more fear than hurt, for they're so timorous that they will fly upon the rattling of two sticks or boards. I saw likewise other fish about a cubit in length that had heads like owls. These are bizarre looking fish. As I was one day at the port after my return, the ship arrived in which I had embarked at Bussarat. I at once knew the captain, and I went and asked him for my veils. I am Sinbad, said I, and those veils marked with his name, they're mine. When the captain heard me speak thus, he said, heavens, whom can we trust in these times? I saw Sinbad perish with my very own eyes. This is someone who knew him before, but doesn't recognize him. 
as did also the passengers on board. And yet you tell me that you are that Sinbad? What impudence is this? And what a false tale to tell in order to possess yourself of what does not belong to you. He's saying, you're not Sinbad. I don't believe you. And now you're trying to steal his things. Sinbad said, have patience. Do me the favor to hear what I have to say. Now the captain was at length persuaded that I was no cheat. For there came people from his ship who knew me, paid me great compliments, and expressed so much joy at seeing me alive. At last he rec recollected me himself and embracing me. Heaven be praised, said he, for your happy escape. I cannot express the joy it affords me. There are your goods. Take and do with them as you please. I took out what was most valuable in my bales and presented them to the Maharaja, who, knowing my misfortune, asked me how I came by such rarities. I acquainted him with the circumstance of their recovery. He was pleased at my good luck, accepted my present, and in return gave me one much more considerable. Upon this, I took leave of him and went aboard the same ship after I had exchanged my goods for the commodities of that country. I carried with me wood of aloes, sandals, camphor, nutmegs, cloves, pepper, and ginger. We passed by several islands and at last arrived at Bussara, from whence I came to the city with the value of 100,000 sequins. There's some very valuable things valuable to you to have would have aloes, like you might think of aloe vera, and nutmeg, and cloves, pepper. But spices were very, very expensive at the time of this story. Hundreds of years ago, there were not spices all over the place. So salt and pepper, as common as those are now, those are very valuable. Now Sinbad stopped here and ordered the musicians to proceed with their concert which the story had interrupted. Now we're back in the present day and Sinbad is telling everyone at his um, table what happened. When it was evening, Sinbad sent for a purse of 100 sequins and giving it to the porter. Now he's giving some money to Hinbad from at the beginning of the story. He said, take this Hinbad, return to your home and come back tomorrow to hear more of my adventures. So the porter went away astonished at the honor done him and um, the present made him. The account of this adventure proved very agreeable to his wife and children who did not fail to return thanks for what Providence had sent them by the hand of Sinbad. Now Hinbad put on his best robe the next day and returned to the bountiful traveler who received him with a pleasant air and welcomed him heartily. When all the guests had arrived, dinner was served and continued a long time. When it was ended, Sinbad, addressing himself to the company, said, Gentlemen, be pleased to listen to the adventures of my second voyage. They deserve your attention even more than those of the first. Upon which everyone held his peace and Sinbad proceeded. So that is the first voyage of Sinbad the sailor. Quite strange that he lands on a sea monster, floats around on the ocean on just a piece of wood, and he happens to come across this island where he gets all of this treasure bestowed on him. So we know that moving into the future, he has a big mansion and all these riches, and he's telling Kinbad, I had to go through a lot of struggle to get all of these riches. Do you think that he earned those in that first voyage? So, the next voyage, as he's going to go out again by sea, he's a sailor, so he's always traveling. Um, we'll see what is even stranger in the second voyage. Okay, and if you're curious, I am at home doing this. Occasionally, I'll do that for the reading videos, um, since I can just do that from here. But I hope you enjoyed the first voyage of Sinbad, and um, I'll have the second voyage up next for you. See you later. Bye.